Well, thank you for welcoming me to this meeting of Placebos Anonymous. You look like a real audience, you really do. You look like a real, genuine audience, unlike the cardboard cutouts, basically making the mock spectators in the cartoon behind me. So I should probably introduce myself in the vernacular and template that is reserved for these kind of meetings. Let me do it. Hi, my name is Dr. Raz, and I am addicted to placebos. Yes, I kid you not, I really am. I systematically study placebos, I read and write about them, I experiment with them, I take them on occasion, and I even think that I know a little bit about them. There you have it. In a way, I'm a placebo scientist, if you'd like to think about it that way. Now, the crux of what I'm about to tell you is that you too, if you're human, that is, foster a strong predilection for placebo effects and placebo responses. You need not be feeble-minded, gullible, uneducated, not at all. You need not be a fan of Star Trek. You don't need to be deeply in love. By virtue of being a member of our species, if you imbue them with meaning, placebos will move you. Even better than that, for some of you, in certain situations, placebos will actually rock you. They will. And what better place than Montreal to talk about these mind-body interactions? Because here, unlike many other places, you can walk up to many a pharmacy, and for a very reasonable price, you guessed it, get your own personal stash of pharmaceutically engineered Kosher placebo tablets. <laughs> and Montreal placebos are crazy in the sense that they work equally well in English and in French. <laughs> but we're not going to be talking here about sugar pills or about saline injections, not at all. We're much more high-minded than that. As a matter of fact, we're so high-minded, we're going to be talking about top-down processing. We're going to be talking about top-down phenomena. We're going to be talking about top-down control, top-down regulation. What does it mean? It starts with what brews between your ears, your thoughts, your expectations, your ideas, your reflections. It all marinates into this complex soup that then trickles, cascades downstream to influence, mold, and shape physiological systems at a lower tier. Confused yet? Don't be. Let me give you an example of what a top-down process is. If I asked you to pay attention to the way that you blink while I continue to talk, okay, even if I asked you to continue blinking in the same way that you had blinked before, neither more nor less than you had blinked usually, weird things are going to start happening. Can you feel it? Frankly, you would draw a blank blink as to how you had blunk before I made this request. But an automatic process that effortlessly keeps your eye moist and clean and ready to see turns into a toilsome, effortful, semi-voluntary experience. Why? Because of my request. I think you're beginning to understand what I mean when I say top-down. And placebos are but one example of a top-down process. Now, sometimes we infuse a healthy bit of parenting deception into our top-down innuendo. Let me give you an example. When I taught my oldest son how to ride his bicycle, I would do what most, a, a lot of parents do. I, I would grab the back seat and I would sort of you know, run with him, making sure that he's all right. As he got better, I would sometimes let go, just to see how he's doing, and then I would grab it again. And I would do it, and do it, and at the end, it was my running presence, not my propping hand, that was actually doing the trick. He was riding on his own. Unbeknownst to him, I was not holding. Now, this kind of parental deception or educational deception, I think most of us would agree is okay. If not downright justifiable, it's certainly very acceptable. How about parental deception when it comes to medical issues. Well, you see, that's where things become a little bit more objectionable, don't they? Well, 
The other night, for example, my elementary school daughter complained about a tummy ache. And without thinking about it too much, I reached for one of those indifferent moisturizers I have around the house, and I started rubbing it around her belly, saying, you know, all kinds of things into her ear. Listen, sweetie, this stuff is very strong. It comes straight from Switzerland. It's going to make you feel better before you know it. It worked like magic. It really did. But I felt a little bit uncomfortable. Why? Because we have very strong feelings about lying, not just to our children. And certainly, certainly, we have some reservations about mixing deception with medicine, right? Now, deception is very tricky, and I think we agree that deception as a general currency is probably a bad form, but I am a former magician. I'm a former conjurer, a trickster, an actor who is playing the role of a wizard, an artist, and in time, I'm going to show you some interesting things about deception. Particularly, I'm here to tell you that not all deception is bad for you. As a matter of fact, sometimes <laughs> a little bit of dishonesty is good for you. Let me talk to you a little bit about hypnosis. Hypnosis is something that I have been using in my lab for several decades now. And in hypnosis, we refer to a process that is called a non-deceptive placebo. Why is it non-deceptive? Because in most typical hypnosis experiences, people come into the lab, you tell them that there's a helium balloon attached to their wrist. Of course there isn't, but you tell them that there is. And as a result, their hand begins to levitate and elevate and do all kinds of things. And they're under the impression that this elevation is happening because of the helium balloon that isn't there. But they know that it isn't there. There's something weird about this situation, but it's not deceptive because in hypnosis, there is suspension of disbelief. Pretty soon, I'm going to show you how I study these kind of experiments, these kind of top-down control in my lab. I'm going to show you in a minute a visual paradigm that is going to involve lines that are going to be dancing around. In this case, we're going to use four lines only. These lines are going to be dancing around, and it's going to be difficult for you to tell what geometric shape they make. It's going to be difficult for you to tell until I introduce these occluders, these kind of masks that are going to cover the corners. Once I introduce the corners, it's going to be very easy for you to see the shape and whether it's going counterclockwise or clockwise, I mean, depending on the shape. Now, I'm going to play it for you so you can actually see it. And as you can see with the lines moving about, you'll see the two lines are moving together and the other two lines are moving together. It's very difficult to see what's going on here exactly, but as soon as I'm going to introduce these occluders, you're going to see that this is actually a what? That's right, a diamond that is moving you know, in a particular direction. It's very important that you understand that once I take the occluders out, everything falls apart. But once I put it back there, again, here you go, very clear what the shape is. Now, would it be possible to take people who are highly hypnotizable, sometimes we call them highs, can we take people who are highly hypnotizable and tell them that the occluders are actually there when they're not? Just impose on them and tell them they're actually occluders there and expect them to hallucinate the occluders. And as a result of that, see whether they can actually see the figure and the direction. Turns out that the answer is yes. This is an experimental question, so you can do an experiment. We do the experiment, and we see that for people who are highs, they score very, very, very highly. A towering result. There's something special about being highly hypnotizable, perhaps as special as being a good placebo responder. We're still trying to find the link between being a good placebo responder and being a highly hypnotizable person. But you don't need to be. You don't need to be highly hypnotizable or a good placebo responder in order to experiment and in order to see what's going on. Let me give you an example. Let's say that I asked you to participate in this study that involves combing your hair. I have a special box. And from the box, I take a regular comb. And the comb looks like a men's comb from the 1940s, plastic, nothing special. But, of course, I don't qualify for this kind of experiment because I don't have much to comb. But let's say that you do, and I hand you the comb gingerly, and you take the comb and you comb your hair. And you do it for, let's say, two minutes. And the purpose of the study is for you to tell me how the experience was. So you do it for two minutes, and like many weird psychological experiments, you say at the end, I felt good, I felt bad, and at the end, you give the comb back, and I put it in the box, end of experiment. Or is it? It's not the end of the experiment, because then the experimenter turns to you after you filled out all the questionnaires, how you felt and everything, and he says something like this, oh, sorry, you're probably wondering about the glove. You see, 
this is no regular comb. This used to be Hitler's comb. Now, these last two words, Hitler's comb, will change the experience for most people, certainly for people with my family background and national heritage, because there's something about meaning that we connect with very, very strongly. There's something that defines the experience, even in retrospect, after it was over, just giving this information changes the whole experience. Now, as we move deeper afield into the twilight zone that is between deception and top-down processes, I want you to understand that in real life, people have shown time and again that it's possible to even use deception without deception. In a way, you can take placebos and use them even without tricking people into thinking that they're not placebos. You can do this with irritable bowel syndrome, you can do this with lower back pain, you can do this with ADHD. People have done these studies. You can also demonstrate that you can use placebos with non-human animals. So the question is, what is this mysterious effect that starts up top and then trickles down and changes our physiology in all kinds of weird ways? Can we quantify it? Can we understand the mechanisms? And the answer is yes, we're beginning to. And let me tell you a little bit about that and why you should care, because all of you are thriving on placebos and you don't even know it. Let me show you a few examples. Well, first of all, I'd like to start talking about antidepressants. Why antidepressants? Because a lot of people in our culture are taking antidepressants. In the US alone, one in 10 people are on antidepressants. When it comes to um, middle-aged women, it's one in four. These are staggering numbers, staggering numbers. And why do you take antidepressants usually? This is a major backbone drug of modern psychiatry. Why do people take antidepressants? Well, all kinds of reasons, but mostly for depression. And usually for mild to moderate depression. But we have a lot of evidence that shows that for mild to moderate depression, clinically, antidepressants and placebos are on par. Well, what does that mean? Well, some people take it to mean that antidepressants don't work, and there's a big commotion around it, and I think there should be. But in a way, what I'm here to tell you is that that's wrong. Antidepressants do work. They work well. They work so well that clinically, for mild to moderate depression, they work as well as placebos do. <laughs> this is how good placebos are. This is how powerful they are. Now, some people listen to this and say, well, I've, I've heard of other examples from clinical medicine. For example, sham surgery versus real surgery. And this is true. This has been done for the knees and for other parts of the body. And sometimes we can show that sham surgery and real surgery are on par. But this is not the point that I want to make. I want to make a point, a little bit of a point about technology. For example, take neurofeedback. I think many people don't realize that today we have technology that allows us to watch our brains in action. We can actually see what's happening inside our brain while it's happening in real time. And some people use it therapeutically in order to help people get better and change their behavior and so on. In the image that you see here, you're basically looking at a creme de la creme, inverted toilet on top of your head kind of you know, technology that allows us to do this kind of thing. When you go into a regular neurofeedback clinic, you're not going to see this. This is way out of budget for most people and very rare. They will basically use EEG neurofeedback on you. They just put you know, a few electrodes on your head and listen to the elect, you know, electrical jazz that is playing under your scalp. But the point is that what you see on the screen, which is allegedly the feedback from your brain, is not so important. What do I mean by that? If I show you your own brain activity, my brain activity, his brain activity, her brain activity, if, even if I doctor up a video from a simulated brain and I show it to you, people get better. People get better. What does it smell like to you? It smells to me, it reeks of a placebo component. There's nothing wrong with it. It just shows you how powerful placebos can be, even if you pay a lot of money for them. Now, I mentioned hypnosis before. I would be remiss if I wouldn't mention meditation. Meditation is all the rage these days. Meditation is in vogue. And when I say meditation, I don't necessarily mean mindfulness, and I don't necessarily mean yoga or guided imagery or you know, um, compassion training, whatever. Pick, pick and choose. I mean, it's completely, it's a free world. I'm talking about the idea of a top-down process. All these contemplative 
practices are basically allowing us to see what is happening in the brain, in our body, in our physiology as a result of practicing these top-down techniques. And we're beginning to see what's happening, we're beginning to understand what's happening, and we're beginning to understand who are the people who are likely to benefit from this more. We're beginning to understand what are the systems that are involved. More than that, we are now getting into sort of a new uh, kind of direction where these techniques that were present thousands of years ago, I mean, meditation, Buddhism, thousands of years back, we don't have to go that far. If you go back to the recent past, 1970s, I got you a black and white picture showing you the think-drink effect that a lot of people don't know about. The think-drink effect is something that people don't know about because they're too familiar with the drink effect. The drink effect is what happens when you, you know, imbibe uh, alcohol in generous amounts. I, you don't need a TED talk for that. But what people don't realize sometimes is that you can actually get a non-alcoholic beverage. This is my uh, alcohol, placebo alcohol. And, um, you know, if you give people a non-alcoholic beverage, you can sometimes get some pretty good results if they are under the impression that this is an alcoholic beverage. So much so that they will show you impaired cognition, slurred speech, inability to walk a straight line. They will vomit. They will have, you know, hangovers. <laughs> Serious stuff. All on alcohol. Now, sometimes when we do these experiments, the people who are susceptible to this are too drunk to understand that the experiment is over when you tell them, you know, this was a hoax. <laughs> this is strong stuff. This is alcohol for you. Now, what have we had here today? I mean, we, we had some, you know, blinking. We had uh, all kinds of parental deception. We had a magician who's an honest liar. We had some hypnosis with dancing lines. We had Hitler's comb. We had some antidepressants. We had neurofeedback. Now I'm beginning to talk to you about meditation and alcohol. Listen, at the end of the day, although deception is a slippery slope, and it is a slippery slope, we are in the process of gaining better scientific insights into what it is to use the power of top-down control. And as a result, we're beginning to ponder if it would be possible to use placebos in a way that is both judicious and ethical. Judicious and ethical. And I am here to tell you and to submit to you that in some circumstances, it is actually unethical not to use placebos. But we can talk about that over a stiff drink of alcohol. Whatever you do, whatever you do, I want you to, next time you hear a person come to you and say, hi, my name is Dr. Raz and I am a alcoholic." please don't laugh, it's a serious top-down matter. It's a serious top-down matter. Thank you for placeboing with me today. Cheers.